welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. Focus Wire joined as always by David Litwack from uh, uh, Mozio. Welcome to another episode of How I Got Here. These are the inside stories in travel innovation and startups and entrepreneurship. Um, we're delighted in this episode to welcome Ethan Bernstein. He's the CEO and co-founder of Freebird. So for those of you that don't know, Freebird is a, a simple, it says, mobile platform that lets business travelers skip the line and instantly book a new ticket after a flight cancellation, significant delay or misconnection. Uh, those three often happen, as we all know. It works on any airline, it says, and it's also free. Hooray, that's terrific. So uh, the company is based in uh, Boston in Massachusetts, and uh, Ethan may be correcting me in a second, but I believe it's raised just over 16 million to date. Um, enough of me and the wordy intros. Welcome, Ethan. Thanks for joining us on How I Got Here. Yeah, thanks so much. Glad to be here, Kevin. Okay, Ethan. So uh, as the first question we always ask everybody is give us your brief overview of how this all kind of came together, please, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So I was in business school when I first came up with this idea, um, went on a long ski trip weekend uh, over President's Day weekend with a, with a bunch of friends. There's actually a couple hundred of us traveling from Boston to Breckenridge, Colorado for some uh, amazing skiing. Uh, everybody was moving a little slowly on Monday morning when we went back to the airport. Um, there were two flights that everybody had planned to get home on. They were both nonstop flights from Denver back to Boston, almost identical in every way except different airlines. The flight that I was on, uh, we left a little bit late, but we got back fine. The other flight, which dozens of my friends were on, that flight was canceled because of maintenance reasons. And all of the people on that flight were automatically rebooked, reaccommodated onto the red eye of the following night. So over 30 hours later. And Oof. you know, you, you can just imagine mayhem, mayhem in the airport, you know, people jumping out of their seats upon hearing the news, running to stand in line, calling the call center. I had a friend who did a 180 and walked out of the airport and went and booked a hotel because she just didn't even want to deal with it. Um, you know, so I, I had a little bit of a front line, uh, front, front row seats to, you know, all the stuff unfolding. It took hours for people to figure it out. Um, you know, obviously not a, not a fun situation for anybody. And I, I kind of knew that, but when I got back to Boston, I started talking to some folks, two things became really clear. The first was that every single person had a miserable experience. Uh, whether they chose to stand in line, call the call center, walk out of the airport, take matters into their own hands and buy a new ticket last minute, whatever they did, it was miserable. And the second thing was that everybody got home and they all got home pretty okay. In fact, better than the flight that they were offered in the first place. So why was it so inefficient? Why was it so miserable for these folks? And, you know, a little bit of background before business school, I actually, I actually worked on the corporate development team at Expedia for four years doing mergers and acquisitions and strategy. So I knew a little bit about the travel space where the data sources were. I knew that travel insurance was this highly profitable, growing uh, business line. Um, but there was obviously this gap there. And so that's when I started thinking really carefully about, well, when people really need to get somewhere important, what's there to help them get there and what's there to help them have a better experience. And that's what started tiptoeing me down the path of, of starting Freebird. And how long did that process take from the, 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 the problems with the ski, the ski <laughs> trip to when you started gathering a team and saying, okay, this is, this is going to be a thing. We're going to do this. Yeah, it was, it was about four or five months before I started working on it with anybody else. So there was, there were a few months there where it was thinking through the problem, um, making sure I understood what, what was out there. Meanwhile, I was in school. So, you know, I, was, I had a, essentially kind of a full-time set of responsibilities. I don't tell my mom, but I, you know, wasn't really doing the schoolwork. I was kind of working on this full-time on the <laughs> side. Um, 
Yeah. So, you know, I started to put things together and say, there really isn't a solution here. There isn't something that puts the traveler first. There isn't, uh, you know, a white glove solution that's scalable. There isn't an insurance solution that solves this problem. So I actually did uh, what a lot of, uh, now hindsight's 2020, what a lot of entrepreneurs do when they're first trying to test out an idea. You know, I sent up a, a test balloon. Um, I wrote up a, an email that I sent to all of my friends and family that said, it was one line, it said, are you traveling in April? Question mark, send. And I sent it to hundreds of people. Um, and for the people that responded back and said yes, uh, I actually had this long pre-written email that said, hey, I'm working on a project, I'm testing this idea. Why don't you pay me 10% of your ticket price? And if anything bad happens to your flight, I'll notify you and I'll pay you uh, three times what you paid for your original ticket. So 30 times the amount that you paid to me. And that will allow you to buy a new ticket or do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself when bad things happen. Um, and so basically you do the mental math and you're like, okay, well, if uh, disruption rates around 3%, which it, you know, it's somewhere between three and 5%, that's, you know, kind of close to break even and small numbers, all that kind of stuff. And I, and I waited, I, you know, waited to see if people would respond at all to see if people would pay money. You know, I'd much less the pro product working. There's no product, by the way. It was just me. <laughs> um, and to my surprise, a lot of people bought it. And I don't think they were just being friendly to me. These are, you know, I was, I was at Harvard Business School. These are really smart, savvy financial folks. And a lot of people bought it. And so, I, you know, I, I kind of went back to everybody who bought it and didn't buy it. I said, you know, uh, why did you buy this? What was your perception of risk? How likely do you think a flight disruption is? And I, I did the same thing with people who said no. And I was surprised. Over 75% of the people who purchased it thought there was a 10% or greater chance of a flight disruption. When in fact, in the month of April, there's less than a 1% chance of disruption. Mm -hmm. So you know, what that said to me is two things. One, people's perception, they, they, they fear the downside a lot more than reality actually you know, dictates. The other part of it is that people obviously care a lot about where they're going. And that, that was really the crux of what got me excited. People travel because they're going somewhere important. They spend a lot of money. They spend a lot of time. It's very inefficient. Here we are. We're, you know, I, I'm guessing, David, you're in, uh, you know, San Francisco. I'm in Boston. You know, these New York, actually, but yeah. <laughs> New York. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, we're doing this, you know, over the internet, over the phone waves. There's Snapchat. There's email. There's text messages. There's lots of ways to communicate with people. But, but when folks actually spend money on going on a trip, there's someone or something that's really important for them. And so all of these emotions are wrapped up in their buying decision, in their planning decisions, and in their lived experience as they make these purchases and approach the date of travel and experience the travel itself. And so if there is a way of actually alleviating those things, for, those concerns for people, now we're really on to something. So that's when I started thinking really carefully about how do I do this. I started looking for a co-founder um, and that all happened within the first four months. It's interesting, just one more from me before David has got some. And that four or five months doesn't seem very long to go through that process of you know, getting it tested by some friends or the concept tested by some friends and family and your own, I guess, internal analysis. Is it, did you just feel very confident based on what that, that feedback that you had from them, that this was something that you could really turn your attention to? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it's kind of, it, it's subtle. There's, there's parts that come from both sides. On the one hand, it's not that much work to do a legitimate test balloon. I mean, I sent a one line email and then I wrote a couple of paragraphs. The product itself, I was just sending people a Venmo and monitoring their flight on flight aware on you know manually typing it into my phone there's there's nothing to it anybody could have set that up in a day which is what i did so on the one hand you know if if people overthink it it takes a long time if you're really trying to test a core idea then you can do it quite quickly i think the other part of it is that you know 
obviously there were a couple of steps to me deciding to, I, I ended up dropping out of school in order to start this. There were a couple of steps that got me there. Obviously there was this little test experiment that I did in Excel. Um, there was more industry research. I, you know, started talking to folks. I started to pay to build a product uh, from a development shop because I'm not, I'm not technical. I met a co-founder. When I really started to, to lean into this and decide whether I was going to drop out of school and do this full time, I had three criteria for myself. Um, I was starting the summer. So it was, you know, I did this instead of a summer internship. I said, okay, well, if I can find a co-founder, one, if I can get a product that works and build it really fast, two, and if I can get a couple people to use it, three, if I can do those three things, then why would I go back to school? And once those three things happened, it happened all in like about six weeks. It happened really fast. It's just a no brainer. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to give folks the wrong impression. Part of it was really methodical, really thought out. I had worked in this industry. I knew the players. I, you know, you know, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of work. And then on the other hand, it was just, yeah, move fast. If you're going to do something, do it. <laughs> start building the airplane in free fall. Don't, don't start thinking about <laughs> jumping. Yeah. So, you said something really interesting there about how uh, the disruption rate is actually 1%, but people think it's 10%. It's almost kind of like you've got an arbitrage opportunity there. And I guess that is kind of what all insurance companies are to some extent. But could you talk a little bit about, you know, the market size, like of those people who think it's 10%, you, you know, I think one of my first thoughts on, he on hearing the business idea is, okay, well, how many people are actually purchasing uh, flight disruption insurance? And, you know, how big of a market could that be? Yeah. Um, so, you know, my understanding of well uh, qualified OTAs, their, their attach on standalone air for an insurance product is somewhere around 10%. And I've heard that from a number of different places, from a number of different OTAs. So it's more than you think. Um, in terms of the arbitrage opportunity, I think, I think that is true to a certain extent, but it's a it's a dark read and it's not one that we typically focus on here. The way that we think about this is people have the opportunity to communicate and interact, uh, form communities, form bonds with people without traveling. They're choosing to travel. They're choosing to invest in an experience, both time and money in that experience because it's really important to them. And if things happen that stop them from, from experiencing those important things for them, it has a non-monetary, and in the corporate environment, definitely a monetary impact on uh, their lives and what they're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to experience. So having folks worry about that along the way, you know, you know, having snowflakes fall outside and starting to worry, that you know, undermines the positive experience they're having. That anxiety and stress uh, kind of ruins part of the trip for them. So yes, there, there's an opportunity to kind of say, well, if people perceive there's a problem here, it'll be easier to sell. But really what, what we're trying to do is say, when you really care about something, either a business meeting or a wedding or a conference or a going home for the holidays, a vacation, whatever it is, uh, you want to make sure that that investment that you've made actually comes to fruition. And, you know, the example I gave earlier, David, about 1%, you know, the actual disruption rate is closer to 5%, um, as we've seen just from being in business for a couple of years now. Um, and it really depends on who you are, where you're going, what flights are on, what time of year, all that kind of stuff. And so it actually gets really complicated really fast. And, you know, from a market sizing perspective, gosh, it's like, kind of like the sky's the limit. Um, when we do back of the envelope, we think it's a multi-billion opportunity, dollar opportunity just in the U.S. Um, and that's, that's kind of being conservative. Did you envisage it being leisure and business initially? Yeah. I, I mean, from day one, we said it doesn't matter if you're a leisure traveler, if you're a corporate traveler, getting to where you need to go is just as important. Again, it's a wedding or it's a business meeting. Who's to say one's important and not the other. Right. But, uh, but the, the, you know, the, the company now says it, you know, it's for business travelers to skip the line, et cetera, et cetera. So the focus now is on business travel. 
it's really it's really interesting. I I didn't want to cut you off when you gave the original intro, but <laughs> we've started to and this is where things start to get uh, interesting. You know, we've we've started to broaden the scope of how we think about our our business. The initial product that we that we built was a direct to consumer product. You know, that was the MVP that I described earlier. It's just, you know, the bare bones, prove that it can work. You know, we ingest flight alerts, a flight's disrupted, we send out a text message to someone, they are able to search for a new flight. Cool, it, it worked. Um, that obviously doesn't solve all the problems all the time. And so, you know, we obviously need to build more when it comes to product. And we need to find the right distribution channels to get those out into market. When we built that first product, we never envisioned our company being a direct-to-consumer company. Um, we always knew that we needed to go through partnership channels in order to get to the end user. It's just too, too expensive to bid on Google for, for travel and insurance keywords um, against the, you know, the bookings and the Expedias of the world. So, from there, we kind of started to focus on, on business, and that's still a core focus of what we do today. We have phenomenal customers. We have an incredible pipeline of Fortune 100 companies. Um, yeah, we're, we're making great inroads there. Um, that was a great first market for us, and what, again, one we're still investing in, but it's fragmented. It has a number of different agencies that are competing against each other. Uh, you know, we can show the business financial outcomes really clearly. And so that's, that's where we started to dip our toes in. And we've made some really, really phenomenal progress over the last couple of years. What we've started to realize recently, and that's picked up um, and accelerated over, I'd say, the last nine months, 12 to nine, nine to 12 months or so, is that there's interest beyond business travel for what we do. And so now we're getting to the point where we say, okay, well, you know, TMC's travel management companies are re really interested in this. Corporations are really interested in this. But guess what? O OTAs are really interested in this too, uh, online travel agents. And also uh, credit cards are really interested in this as well. Mm, okay. Well, very cool. I, just circling back to the corporate travel uh, focus before we move on, and I feel like we might have uh, moved past this a little bit, but I want to <laughs> Um, you, you know, there's multiple ways of going about corporate travel. You can go direct to the, the corporates or you can go through TMCs and, um, <clears throat> Mozio has uh, done both at times. And, um, I can tell you that there's benefits to both you mean, working through another middleman has its upsides and that often they're trusted, but then it's another whole layer of bureaucracy. And I'm just curious how you've thought about engaging with, you know, these, the middlemen TMCs versus going direct to a fortune 500. Yeah, I mean, I think you said it actually really well. It's kind, of, it's kind of both, and there's pros and cons to each. Um, we have TMC partners who are absolutely phenomenal and uh, are thought partners and arm in arm with us when we go to clients. And uh, we have TMCs who just don't cooperate at all and are, in fact, inhibitors in our go to market. And so, you know, it's hard to know exactly where all the chips fall until you're actually in the weeds, dedicating resources and time and energy roadmap to, to those partners. And so our approach, you know, just given that uncertainty, and David, I don't know if you've had the same experience here, but given that uncertainty, our true north through all of this is what does the corporation want? If, they, if they're excited about Freebird and they're excited about the value proposition, they are the catalyst to everything getting done. And if how, how have you like engaging those corporations? Do you find that this is a, a big enough concern for them? Because I think that's kind of another thing from our experience. Whereas, like you know, we're in the ground transportation world. Air and hotel make up you know ninety percent of the the spend, and uh, getting their attention about ground transportation is sometimes tough. Obviously, you're in the air spend world, but um, is it a high enough uh, concern for them that they'll, they're willing to engage and pay attention to you? Yeah, these, these are hard-hitting questions. So I would say that for a, a company that's deciding between migrating their OBT to, or sorry, their online booking tool to another online booking tool or consolidating their global uh, travel agency, that, those priorities trump 
somebody like Freebird, right? If, if that's the type of initiative that they have going on, we, we are not the most urgent thing. And that, we totally get it. But for all the talk about traveler experience and, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, retention and the job market being hot and the value of travel, all that kind of stuff, when folks are bought into that concept, we hit the nail on the head because we're, you know, we can show empirically through existing traveler feedback, through, you know, kind of surveys, through market research, all that stuff that programs like Freebird are actually phenomenally value creative for the company. So as soon as, as soon as a travel manager starts to think, okay, how do I serve my employees? How do I retain my employees? How do I improve traveler experience? We, we pop to the top of the list. And so for us, the challenge is finding the right partners to work with and making sure that they have the ability um, with, in terms of resources and materials and everything they need from us to make the case internally. And, um, you know, when it comes to Fortune 500s, the typical experience we've had is that those players are sophisticated, they're smart travel managers, they know how to get things done, um, and those are our ideal partners. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry for the hard hitting questions, but I, I think you know, I think one thing that a lot of listeners can learn from you know with your success is uh, it's not just uh, enough to have a good idea, but often like how you navigate through these bureaucracies and um, whether or not your good idea is top of mind. I, I've seen a lot of travel pitches that you know focus on something that's way too small, um, even if it will be useful to kind of get the attention. Um, and it's, so it's just, you know, obviously you are successful. So I, I, I believe that there's all these questions to be good, but, uh, but yeah, you know, it's just, I, I think it's a, if you, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that more, but how, how do you think about, yeah. I, how do you think about that? Like, how did you know that this was going to be a big enough concern right off the bat or, or what? No, I know. And by the way, David, I love, I love these, these types of conversations because it's just the reality of the industry and, the more that we talk about it, I think the more that everybody can kind of see eye to eye, whether they're an entrenched incumbent or whether they're a new newcomer trying to come with a new idea. What, what you said a second ago hits the nail on the head. It, it's not enough to have a good idea. Um, I think the idea is a, what you need to kind of take the leap for sure. Without a good idea, <laughs> just don't do it. That said, Navigating the bureaucracies, understanding what is urgent, what isn't urgent, and seeing into the future are all critical things. Otherwise, for one reason or another, you're just going to hit a stumbling block. And believe me, we've hit a lot of them along the way. The, these learnings aren't things that I knew from day one. You know, navigating these bureaucracies, learning, learn, you know, taking the lumps, getting the scars, like that's that's the stuff that's uh you know where when people talk about founder resilience that's that's what they're talking about it's you got to try this by doing um so i mean i think the part that that really struck a chord with me that you said a moment ago is just finding the urgency from the folks that you're selling to is something that you may not be able to anticipate but you have to adapt to and solve for, otherwise it ain't gonna happen. Um, you could be doing the greatest things in sliced bread, and if it's not the top of their list, and it isn't gonna get done. Um, and so, I mean, the one exception I can think of is something you know, like Airbnb, where uh, they just struck such a chord that the market was, or Uber, right? The, the market had to catch up with them, um, and they were able to overcome urgency and bureaucracy and all that stuff because. Employees just started using it, and there's only a few types of models out there that that's actually conducive, um, or something like that's actually conducive to to leapfrog leapfrog the bureaucracy. Um, but yeah, I mean, for folks who are thinking about getting into this, figuring out how to navigate it, figuring out how to be top of mind and urgent, um, must haves. And I, I think I think you've probably seen that too. It, it's it's interesting, um, uh, Ethan. I mean, for fear of focusing on the negative, I mean, you said that there are plenty of stumbling blocks along the way. I mean, what were what were some of the more significant ones 
that that you did kind of uh, well, let's presume you got over them out the other side very well. I mean, what what were some of the significant ones that you're able to share with us? Well, I, I don't want to promote the fable of all startups are killing it all the time too much. <laughs> I I would say that uh, startups Good. are a roller coaster, right? And uh, I forget who I I really have to find out who. I remember who told this to me because I have to attribute it to them. So this is not my idea, but uh, somebody once drew on a board for me uh, a graph and the line starts at the, you know, the X, Y axis and it goes to the right and it starts to do the sine wave, you know, it goes up and then down and then up and down and each wave gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And they were like, this is the startup journey. The first year you thought that high was really high and you thought that low was really low. And then the second year you thought that high was really high and that low was really low. And it just increases, you know, every, every day is uh, trying to figure something out that hasn't been established before. You're, I saw that graph actually in the messy middle by Scott Belsky, who did uh, the hands actually. So I'm not sure if that's where it's from, uh, but, uh, but yeah, he talks a lot about that. I, I love it because that's definitely not where I saw it. So I'm sure somebody's borrowing some, somebody's idea somewhere. Um, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so, you know, it's, it's this, it's this uh, you know, when you're conjuring something out of thin air, you know, you're not going to get it right perfectly every time. And, um, you know, if I told you next year you were going to grow 693%, um, that's a guess, right? And even if you hired perfectly for that exact number, how could you even hire perfectly for that number? The number is still going to be wrong. And so you're still going to have overhired or underhired. And so there's, there's, always, there's always something that doesn't go according to plan. We're dealing with Pressures. I, I'd say at, at this moment for our company, we're in, we're in one of the best positions we've ever been in as a company. Um, we've also just gone through one of the lowest low points a couple of weeks ago. It's it's absolutely. I you have to live it to actually understand it. It's it's crazy. So we're. I mean, that's all to say. You know, we're not killing it all the time. Um, can you can you elaborate on some of the details of those ups and downs though? Um, I mean, yeah, some of the stuff is a little bit behind the scenes, um, uh, and some of it delves into some, some personal stuff for some folks at our company. So I'd probably stay away from that, but yeah, I mean, just when you think you're on the ropes, you know, some things start to go well and that picks up momentum. Um, you know, the darkest hour people's fears come out, which makes things worse, but it's actually not as bad as everybody thought. So as soon as things flip, it gets a lot better. Uh, I don't want to go too much further than that, but you know, animal spirits exist in, in communities as well as in the markets, if that makes sense. You sound a very uh, glass half full type of guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say so. Um, I also, say, would you say you have to be as a, as a startup founder? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the pressure, and David can probably speak to this too. I mean, the pressure and the expectations and the scrutiny um, and the aloneness and the onness that, that you need to have at all times. It's like if you, if you look into the darkness and you become consumed by it, it's all over. It's, it, it really is that level of intensity. So, um, you know, my, there have been really dark times for me too. I'd, I'd say my, my uh, impulse is to just always look for the, the way to make the situation as good as it can be given the circumstances. And that's the part where, you know, when things are really bad, you just, you know, it's by sheer force of will, you just say, okay, well, I see a speck of light on the horizon. <laughs> I'm better off going that way than any other way. And, you know, being decisive and simple and focused and, and moving quickly about that type of stuff that's what kind of pulls you through those time periods. And candidly, it's like, it's like every favorite television show we ever have, just when things seem so down, you become consumed by the bad idea is when things flip and all of a sudden everybody's mentality changes and mm. great things start happening. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you kind of got to live it to, hopefully I'm kind of getting close to something, but uh, you kind of got to live it, live it to understand it. So tell us, um, how did you meet Sam Zimmerman, your co-founder? Is that someone through your network in Boston, or you know, you obviously you know you had your your ski trip that went wrong, and then five months later you were ready to launch, and presumably in that period you you met with Zat, with Sam. How did that kind of come about? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you the uh, the 
the kind of the short story, which sounds like it was meant to be. And then I'll <laughs> tell you the longer story. The short story is I met his roommate at a party that was hosted by uh, one of our future investors. And that person was working on a travel startup at the time. And I started talking to him and then I explained what I was looking for in a co-founder. And he said, you got to meet my roommate. And so Sam and I went on a long walk along the Charles river and I talked to him about risk management and the vision for the company. And then we started to work together over a couple of months and I convinced him to, to leave his job. Um, okay. That's the short version. <laughs> okay. The, uh, well, I guess I should, it's not the long version. It's probably the real version. The real version <laughs> is uh, I probably explained the job incorrectly to like a thousand people before I finally got the description for what I was looking for right. And I was really lucky because I probably got it right, started to get it right within a couple of weeks of actually meeting his roommate. So what sounds like it was meant to be, I was at a party, it was you know, kind of like this rooftop elitist party with a bunch of investors and startups. And, and of course, we, it was meant, no, it was, I, I explained it poorly. I, you know, I was looking for someone who did big data and eventually someone told me, don't say big data. That, that is an immediate turn off to every data scientist you'll ever talk to. And then I was looking for, you know, an actuarius, you know, someone who does insurance modeling. And then my insurance uh, friend who worked in, who was an actuarial said, you're not looking for an actuarial, you're looking for a mathematician. So then I started saying, well, I'm looking for a mathematician, but then it was actually a statistician. And, you know, so it kind of like rolled through all these different permutations of what the company actually needed, what I was actually looking for, what the job actually was until I finally had this breakthrough moment where it all seemed to fall into place. But gosh, it, it took a thousand failures to get to that conversation where I got really lucky. I mean, tell us just quickly uh, one more for me. I'm interesting what you were saying about getting the description right and things like that. Did you, did you ever go through a process when you were talking to potential investors when you didn't quite describe it correctly, do you think? <laughs> I, I'm sure I did. Uh, actually, it's funny. This is almost too perfect, which plays into the thing I said that it wasn't. But uh, earlier that day, I did my first ever <laughs> investor pitch. <laughs> and uh, it was actually for something called Rough Draft Ventures, which is uh, the student-run little tiny VC arm of General Catalyst, who turned out to be one of our two lead investors. And, uh, and so I was the last pitch of the last day of the final day of the school year. And so I, I kind of came in and the first slide in my deck was, I don't have a co-founder, but I need one. <laughs> and then I kind of went on to pitch the business. Um, and so later on, they told me, hey, you know, this is, that was, that was phenomenal. By sharing your, your greatest weakness on the first slide, on the team slide, it's just me, I need somebody else. Uh, it allowed them to relax in their seats and actually hear the opportunity rather than looking for the, the, you know, the, the blind spot, the missing okay. piece, the thing I was hiding. So you know, that, was, that was how I described it. Um, I told them that I was looking for you know, a data scientist. I gave them the same description I did later that night. Um, to the to the friend of the roommate of my now co-founder um, so it all it all really kind of interestingly fell into place but I'll, I'll have you know that you know a couple days before that first ever pitch um, I'd never done a pitch before in my life uh, I'd never really done public speaking before um, and so I, you know not to not to put myself up on a pedestal here I don't I don't think I'm the God's gift to podcasts, but um, <laughs> I would just say if, if somebody out there is listening and they've never done any of this stuff before, I'd say you got to start somewhere. And that's basically what I did too. I, I just want to delve deeper in a little bit onto, I, I find it to be really interesting about how pitches uh, evolve over time because, you know, we've been doing Mozio for eight and a half years. And at the very beginning we were, you know, calling it, you know, GDS or ITA software for ground transportation. And then, uh, you know, mobility as a service or, you know, it's, or concur for ground. We, 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 our pitch changed over time, depending on kind of often what was the new trendy thing that venture capitalists were, uh, <laughs> were all of a sudden. Um, but also kind of, frankly, like that's, you know, putting the blame on them when they don't necessarily deserve it all. Sometimes it's, you know, we learned about what was uh, appealing and what um, kind of 
uh, uh, analogy was actually breaking through. So I'd love if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on how you, you know, pitch this over time and, and how that evolves. Yeah. I mean, well, first I'll, I'll just say kind of a high level thing, which is, um, you know, the, our ability to be successful, we have to fit into other people's initiatives and strategies and focus. Um, with a direct to consumer company, you can kind of make your own luck sort of kind of, as long as you're willing to put your head in the mouth of the dragon that is Google or Facebook or whatever. Um, but for folks that, that are B2B or need to develop partnerships, you do need to fit into what they're trying to accomplish. So listening to the strategy, strategies and initiatives of your partners and potential partners and clients and potential clients uh, is critical. So yeah, it may be a little bit of a dirty reputation of, of uh, founders to kind of say what VCs want to hear or say what companies want to hear. But at the end of the day, you're just trying to fit in. Um, and it actually makes their job easier too because they know what to listen for. But that's, that, that's kind of like the high level. Um, our, our pitch, we started out day one by literally describing what we do. We are a mobile rebooking service that allows you to rebook a disrupted flight in three taps in less than 30 seconds. And that was kind of, that was the pitch. There's no magic. There was no part about experience or whatever. It was basically just like, hey, this is a, a problem. This is how we're solving it. And, and my understanding is even folks like Airbnb back in the day, if you go to, um, I forget, the internet look back machine. What's that, what's that website called? I forget what, it, what it's called. But the, the Wayback Machine. Yeah. The Wayback Machine, yes, thank you. Um, their original website was something like, book a bed and breakfast <laughs> to stay in, or you know, something, something really literal. And when you first get started, in order for people to understand you, you have to explain exactly what you do because your early adopters don't care about your positioning. They care about the core functionality. Once we started to get that nailed, um, our pitch started to move into a little bit less focused on exactly what we do and a little bit more into what the purpose was for, for um, us existing, which for starters needs to be for a new industry. We, we, you know, we were kind of the first folks to do what we do. It was to outline the problem, right? It was to explain why this was a problem that people should care about. So uh, it was, you know, flight disruptions are bad for business. I think that might actually still be on our website, but we're gonna be changing it pretty soon. Flight disruptions are bad for business, and here are all the reasons why. Why they're so bad. Did, did you know that they increase your cost of air travel by 5 to 15%? You didn't? Oh, well, we have a solution. And I think the, the natural evolution is once people understand what the problem is and what the opportunity is, that's when you can finally kind of reach the final, uh, broadly speaking, expression of, of how to position yourself, which is this is our... This is our aspiration. You know, we, we create, we transform traveler experiences. We help people get to the people and places that matter to them. Um, so so it, it sounds almost kind of like it, it, there's a, you know, a phrase pitch um, benefits, not features, right? It, it sounds almost like maybe at the beginning though, you started pitching out a little bit uh, more on the feature side because you needed to kind of just explain. Is that an accurate? Explanation? Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. And then in, um, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's uh, folks who feel differently. I'm sure there's examples that prove differently, but most like really early stage startups that are trying to get their first user, their second user, their third user, unless they're, tr unless they're moving into a very established market um, and, and trying to kind of uh, be a new entrant in a very established market, you have to first describe what it is you're doing. Like why is Mozio better than the alternative? Um, what is it that you actually do? And, you know, if, if you're selling um, cereal, you don't have to be like, this is something that you eat in the morning that gives you energy for the day, right? People already understand what cereal is and what its purpose is. So you can just straight up express yourself and market it. Um, but for anybody who's trying to solve a true pain point that hasn't been solved before, I think you do need to start with features 
And then as soon as you start to get a little bit of a sense of, you know, this is working, then you move past your true early adopters into describing the problem to the mass market. And as soon as the mass market starts to understand what that problem is and why it's important, then you can start to, you know, move into the book and experience, uh, you know, uh, world's best service, you know, starting to get into territory where it's a little bit more lofty language, lofty imagery. And we're, we're still on that journey. So I may be proven wrong, but that's, <laughs> that's where I'm currently thinking. Very cool. Um, I want to go back to something you said, because uh, we had a podcast with Aaron Gall from Silver Rail, and he, uh, he basically said there's a difference between fixing a business and disrupting a business. And you actually touched on that a little bit. Um, where you said there's the ones who can get away with it, like Airbnb and Uber, um, where people had to catch up with them because they were kind of, you know, true disruptors. And, um, you know, I, I count Mosey in the fix a business category. And it sounds like what you're saying uh, is that you're also in the fix a business category. Could you, you know, maybe elaborate a little bit more on how you, you've thought about that and how do you go about building a, uh, a fix a business you know, uh, startup versus a disruptor? Yeah. My, my favorite analogy for fix a business uh, that as it relates to us at Freebird is Climate Corp, if, if you guys have heard of it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for the folks out there that haven't, you know, um, a Google engineer, I forget his name, um, was uh, kind of driving home on a rainy day and he drove by a bike store and the bike store was closed because it was rainy. So nobody was riding their bikes. And he said, well, you know, what if they had an insurance product? that you know compensated them for rainy days because they had lost revenue today and you know he, he basically kind of uh over the course of a couple of years iterated on that and eventually realized the real opportunity was farmers <laughs> when farmers have a dry season they lose their livelihood and so that's kind of eventually where they landed and they were acquired by Monsanto for a couple billion dollars and and yada yada that that is kind of how we sometimes think about what we're doing in the travel space, right? Um, we aren't direct to consumer. We didn't create a marketplace like Uber or Airbnb did. Um, what we are doing is helping to create transparency and a better experience in a way that the incumbents couldn't provide. And I, I don't think even if they had the will to do so could provide. Um, and doing so in a way that, that, you know, stands on the shoulders of the air travel industry, which is, you know, I'm tr I, I don't know if I can even do the math in my head, a 12 figure annual industry in the U S alone. Um, right. It's, it's enormous. And so we are fixing something, but we're doing it in a way that's deeply defensible and makes an enormous outsized impacts on people's lives when they're able to help them. And, and I think this really um, uh, is important for folks who are, who are being fixers is, you know, creating a true 10x experience uh, for folks who use it. Tell, tell me, um, Ethan, what are your ambitions in terms of, you know, uh, extending the service around the world? Yes, you work, this all works on any airline, but I, I sense that the focus at the moment or has been um, mostly in North America. I mean, when you've been looking at other markets, I'm thinking of Europe in particular, which is even more fragmented, whether that's on a country basis or an airline basis. How have you looked at that? And if you found any things that have made you think maybe we should just concentrate in our home kind of market for the time being? Yeah, there's nothing that scared us away from going international. It's more been the size of the opportunity in the U.S. is, is so large. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's captured a lot of our attention. Um, yes, there are, there are complexities when you go overseas in, in the space that we're playing in, you know, there's consumer protection laws that are different in, in the EU. There's obviously language and culture, there's data availability issues. There's a whole bunch of different stuff. At the end of the day though, what we're really providing is a better transformative experience for people. And I, I don't just mean like, cool, you rebooked in three taps. I mean people get anxious, they get stressed, they don't know what to do. It is a terrible feeling to not be in control. And we have spent a lot of time and energy honing in on how to change people's perceptions and change their experience so that they walk away from something where they got bad news, your flight was canceled, or you're, get, 
you're going to have to wait until tomorrow to get there because of the ice storm turned into something where they actually feel better and good. That type of thing, you can't just port it. You can't just, you know, copy paste into another area. I, I wish it could. Um, but there's just so much subtlety that goes on in the way that we interact, the way that we communicate, the parts that we automate, the parts that we don't automate. Um, I mean, again, these are all edge cases, right? There's no single booking. <laughs> um, people are having weird situations and weird preferences. So uh, we, our aspirations definitely go international, um, but we want to make sure that we're doing it the right way and we're preserving the heart and soul of, of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so stay tuned. <laughs> it's the best I can say right now, but uh, we get the question every day. So we know our clients want it. We know our partners want it. Um, we even have folks that raise their hand and say they want to pilot with us to do that all in due time. There hasn't been any, just a follow up on that. I mean, there hasn't been any pressure from your investors or previous investors to, to, to roll out quicker globally then just no, because, actually, just because actually, the opportunity and the dollar signs might be even bigger if you do. Yeah, the, the, actually the opposite occurred. So, uh, you know, our investors advised us to wait to expand internationally um, because in their experience, you know, folks usually expand too quickly, too early, and it brings on a whole host of other, other issues. Um, I know David ran a very international business. Um, they were, you know, I don't want to speak too much for him, but, you know, largely remote, largely fra fragmented, um, you know, very different business model than us. So we just wanted to make sure that when we did it, we were ready to go full bore into it do it the right way and actually have the critical mass that's necessary to, and the focus necessary to make it successful. For now, we're growing. We have incredible prospects. Uh, you know, we have incredible channel opportunities right here in the U.S. And so at a certain point, the dam's going to break and it's going to overflow beyond the borders. For now, for now it's been the U.S. Um, but yeah, again, we get that question every single day. So it's just a matter of time. <laughs> I want to quickly ask about those investors. I know you have Joel Cutler at General Catalyst, which um, anyone in the industry obviously knows he's a pretty legendary investor. Um, and anyone not in the industry listening to this podcast, uh, uh, well, that's what he is. He's pretty much the de definitive uh, travel industry guy who helped launch uh, Kayak. And, um, you know, I think maybe just this is kind of in the category of almost general startup advice, but. Um, I think Mozio has something like 45 investors and I feel like a lot of investors talk up the idea of them, them, them being value add. Um, and very often that's, you know, uh, bullshit and they don't really do anything for you and they don't have any real expertise and they, you know, once they give you the check and they're in your round, they don't chuck your company, they don't answer your emails anymore sometimes, uh, because they, they're on to the next deal. Um, uh, obviously not all of them. Um, and any of my investors listening, I'm definitely not talking about you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I'm curious, it sounds like they've given, uh, you know, some very, very valuable feedback around you're not expanding in this example you just gave. Um, so could you maybe elaborate a little on that? Yeah. Yeah. And I think you actually didn't even provide the worst version of investor, which is provide no value, but still breathe down your neck every other day. Yeah. And request financials and dumb stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> That's, so, so to be clear, we don't have any investors like that. I, I um, have, I have definitely reevaluated sometimes being like, you know what, someone who just doesn't interfere sometimes is a good investor now. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Quiet. I mean, qu quiet is no problem with me. It, you know, we have passed on investors that I, you know, that I felt wouldn't have been, they would have been a squeaky wheel or, um, you know, wouldn't have been good partners to us. Yeah. I, I mean, pick, picking your investors, it don't get much more important than that. And uh, it's not because that they are going to make or break your business, only a founder and a company and the employees and the strategy and the market and, that, that's where the real magic happens. But investors can on easily uh, torpedo a company in a whole host of different ways, whether it's, you know, controlling the purse strings or bad mouthing you, you know, behind the scenes at cocktail parties or, uh, you know, rejecting certain things when it comes up for vote or asking questions every single day and distracting you from the business they can undermine you in a million ways. And there are a couple of ways where they can just totally 
add more value than you can find anywhere else. Um, when we when we raised money originally, and by the way, our our two lead investors, Joel, Joel Cutler and Jeff Fagman, who's on the board of Hopper and has another number of other travel investments under his belt. We have incredible travel uh, investors. They're both walking distance from our office. Um, we actually went through a period of time where, uh, I mean, Joel was trying to give me money for a number of months before we actually took it. And so we, we took the time to get to know them. We, um, we understood what they were bringing. We saw how we worked together, um, all that stuff before we finally were like, okay, it's time, let's do this. And it, it happened pretty fast um, for that first round of funders. I think we're a little bit different because we were in such close proximity, because they had such domain expertise, all that stuff. I know a lot of really phenomenal founders and businesses that have not been able to raise money from these guys. That's not to pat myself on the back. I think I just, right place, right time, got lucky. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the courtship process with investors is the same as a marriage process with a significant other. Like if you don't know who they are, if you don't know who they are in good times and bad, if you haven't gone through a rough <laughs> spot with them, if you haven't played hard to get, if you don't feel mysterious to them and they don't feel mysterious to you and you still have really positive feelings and then you vet them out after that, <laughs> it's not going to be a successful marriage. It's not going to be a successful investor relationship. Uh, I don't care how good their pedigree is. There are good partners and bad partners at the same firms. So, I, that's yeah. great. Uh, David, we, we've inadvertently perhaps pivoted the uh, How I Got Here podcast to marriage guidance as well, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is terrific. So uh, last one from me, very short one. I mean, uh, before David uh, uh, wraps us all up for the, the end of this episode, um, what's been the hardest thing so far? Um, is it been raising money, dealing with investors, building the technology, managing the team or dealing with partners? I would, I would say the travel industry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, everybody loves to stand on the soapbox and talk about the $1.3 trillion market. Um, mm -hmm. the way that I, the way that I describe it to investors that don't know travel that well is humans have been traveling since the dawn of time. First they were walking, then they found other modes of trans transportation. This entire industry has so many fragmented, small little ecosystems here and there that filled every need and gap over the course of multiple millennia that at the time that you know we arrived here there's a lot of change but there's also a lot of competitive tension and so finding your way into that there are a few success stories but there are tens of thousands of failures mm -hmm. and so for people to understand that history you know anytime someone comes to me with a travel startup idea I immediately point them to, you know, some of the uh, kind of hi history of online travel types of um, reading materials where I'm like, if you don't read this 40 page thing, <laughs> I, don't, don't dive in. Um, that said, there's incredible opportunities. There's a reason why I did this. Um, but gosh, travel industry is tough. Yeah. Thanks. Hey. Yeah. I want to quickly mention one more thing. I, I think, uh, uh, when when I started asking you a question, I wanted to go two different directions. I had to choose one, so I'm going to loop back. Uh, <laughs> you said um, we were talking about like features and benefits and stuff like that. This will be our last question of the podcast, but um, it's not even so much a question. I just like you to elaborate a little bit more. I I think we found often in our pitches um, that education is really important, I, and I think you called it features. You also you did say the the word education at some point there, but. You know, for Mozio, we definitely realized we had pitches where people said, oh, we don't see how this is a problem. And then I remember I added one slide at the very beginning of our deck, and it was, um, this is the whole global transportation market, and here is the percentage of the world that is Uber. And the title of the slide was, the transportation world is bigger than Uber. And all of a sudden, every single person realized, oh, there is an aggregation problem in ground, and that solved a lot of our problems. And it, it was kind of that education part that you were just talking about. So I, I thought that was you know, a relevant point to kind of harp on a little bit here and I'm not sure if you have anything else to say on it um you already said a, a fair amount but um but yeah that, I just I think that's another way of framing kind of what we were talking about when you said features and benefits I I yeah. think you don't need to think about it for features versus benefits it's also just education yeah I, absolutely I, I'll, I'll say one thing really quick which is um we have a very similar first slide that we also inserted in after learning about this we used to start with flight disruptions are bad for business 
we then for in the specifically in the corporate space we started with a slide now we start with a slide that says business travel is about business not travel you know for every dollar of spend companies on average generate nine dollars and fifty cents of revenue one dollar and ninety cents of profit and so when people are going on trips this isn't about a cost center this is about a source of revenue and profit and if people aren't getting there your business isn't moving forward and so it was the same realization that that you had right it transforms the conversation from thinking about it as we're fixing a problem to this is something that drives to the core of what the business is trying to accomplish yeah no, I, I advise a bunch of startups, and I think the education recommendation, you know, recommendation to add a slide like that is probably 50% of the recommendations I get on pitch. <laughs> well, um, that's nice to hear that you did the same thing. It's, uh, you know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, any last questions, Kevin? No, that's all for me. That was great, Ethan. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you both. Yeah. So this has been How I Got Here, Mozio and FocusWire's weekly podcast about innovation in travel and transportation. And thanks for joining us, Ethan. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you both. Thanks for listening to How I Got Here podcast. We'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation. Check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages. And get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week.